blacklist. According to Merriam-Webster, a list of persons who are disapproved of, or are to be punished, or boycotted, or imagine reclaiming that phrase with its negative connotation and resuscitating the term, in our case, an assembly of short stories on race, struggle, and achievement. I don't know, ask me, so where are you from, you know, what's your, uh, your background, what's your origins, <laughs> you know, they, they usually think I'm either Latino or this, that, or that. they think I'm Jewish, I'm in the Jewish book of famous people, <laughs> but as far as, you know, on, on the professional level, I think uh, it's pretty common knowledge that, that I'm half black or whatever. I was never really phased by, by uh, the, sort of the color barrier. You know, um, never really paid, I think my mom paid more attention to it than I did because, you know, she grew up in a time when there was definitely a lot of discrimination going on. But I think I sort of, ignorance was bliss in some ways, I just never paid that much attention to it. I obviously wasn't all the way black and I wasn't all the way white, so I was sort of stuck somewhere in the middle. But, uh, you know, I was sort of always an outcast in everything anyway, so it didn't really pay me. <laughs> when I was probably like eight, nine, ten years old, I used to hang out over at my Aunt Johnny's place, which is basically, you know, South Central LA, and that's where my cousins live. Wayne and Edward, my two cousins, that I would hang out with all the funk music, and, you know, Funkadelic being one of the, and all that stuff, and they could both play. They they would just naturally pick up a bass and drums and just play, not knowing what they were doing. And they were amazing. And so, once I picked up guitar, by the time I was 15, I would go over there and I would jam with those guys. I mean, I know that all the, all the, British guys were so influenced by black musicians to have Jimmy come along and be able to take the music that was so popular at that particular time and bring this element to it, which is uniquely black. It was, it was pretty awesome. I had uh, one band uh, called Snake Pit. I hired the singer, and his name was Rod Jackson, and he was a black guy with a pretty, you know, sort of old school soul kind of voice. As soon as I turned in the material, to, um, I think it was Interscope, Jimmy Ivey. And he's like, oh, we love it, but we're not sure about the singer. They could relate to the sort of heavy rock and roll kind of things, but then mixed with that kind of a soulful voice, which I thought was perfect. They couldn't relate to it. As far as being black and, you know, being in Guns N' Roses, I think the only time there was a realization in the ethnic difference between myself and, say, Axel was when we put out uh, this song called One in a Million that he wrote. The lyrics in it were, I can't even remember, it was just uh, immigrants and faggots and police and niggers. And that was the first time that I was like, you know, I don't really feel comfortable with you uh, making these statements. Suddenly, the, the fact that I was black became very apparent to people on the street, you know, a lot of, a lot of black dudes would come up and go, why, why did you allow that to happen? So they all knew, I didn't really ever think about who thought where I was from that, that much, you know. I think I've been true to my roots as far as what kind of guitar playing that it is that I do, and so no matter what kind of music I'm doing, I'm, I pretty much sort of stick to my guns as far as the style that I do. My mother talked about her dreams as though they were events. Because she never said I dreamed. She said, you know, and I thought, <laughs> if you have no access 
to the political life or the governmental life or the institutional life of your world, you do reinvent or invent a reliance on religion, magic, something else that's yours. I didn't feel uh, the threat of being a woman. I was encouraged by my father to think that way. He thought I was the smartest thing in the world. Me and my sister, he thought we were lovely for the child. But tough. As a young girl, 12 years old, I'm working in somebody's kitchen a couple of hours after school, two dollars a week. And, but I don't know what I'm doing. The woman has equipment. I never saw this woman. <laughs> I don't really know how to scrub the floors. So she would complain. So I complained to my father. And he says, you don't live there. You live here with your people. Go to work, get your money, and come on home. You don't know what you're doing, learn. You know, it's a very important thing to be told at that age what your talents are, what your abilities are, and that you are not beholden to somebody else's opinion. My sister, who is older than I am, got married when she graduated from high school. She didn't want to go to college. I did. So I went to college. And my father was very proud of that. And my mother was very proud of that. And they promised me they could do it for a year. They said, we only have enough money to do it for I said, I only need one. Then I learned that among white girls of a certain age, that was not common, that they educated the boys. That for a girl to go off to college before the boys was, you know, not unheard of or rare. So it's entirely different in the black community, it seems. The fathers pushed the girls to go to college, even if they couldn't send the son, because the girls, if they went away, could get nurturing jobs. Teachers, nurses, some non-threatening thing. If they pushed their men, their boys, they would, you know, want to be promoted. You know, they might want to get a little hot. You know, they would be in a rivalry and confrontational situation. So that's like the race itself decided how to survive and reproduce itself in levels. Writing for me is the only place. It's the only place where I'm not doing what somebody else wants or asks or needs. Writing is mine. So winning the Nobel Prize, suddenly I am in a different league, not just out there in the world, but in my head. That sort of rivalry within oneself that is not self-generated, but generated outside. There's a necessity for me to make sure that my work was not somebody else's version of what I should be writing about. Almost all of the African-American women writers that I know um, were very much uninterested in one area of um, the world, which is white men. That frees up a lot. It frees up the imagination because you don't have that game, you know. And when I say white men, I don't mean just the characters, but I mean the establishment, the reviewers, the publishers, the people who are in control. So once you erase that from your canvas, you can really I studied American literature, classical literature, English literature, <laughs> dramatic literature. All my life has been in those areas. It's a confluence. You know perfectly well that you're pulling from the rest of the world, of course. But what you want to make is this one little place, like the facet of the diamond, this one little shape. And that's where you live. And that's yours. I did a TV pilot called Renegade.
it was all this slang that we didn't understand and we were just like what is this i never heard this word before and we went over to the director because we didn't even know how to say the line because we didn't know what the word was and he didn't know and we called the writer to ask what it meant and he said he just made it up when robert townsend and i decided to do hollywood shuffle ignorance was our greatest asset we didn't know we weren't supposed to be able to make a movie without money without experienced people without permits I mean, we had a van, and we'd put all the equipment in the van, and we'd have somebody stand on the corner and look out for the police, and we would film, and if they whistled, we'd throw all the stuff in the van and take off and come back 15 minutes later. One of the first ideas that Robert and I had was a parody of horror films, and the idea was to take black people and put them in a horror movie and see how they react to these killers versus a white audience. Black audiences always laughed at white people in horror movies because they did the exact opposite of what we would do. I just saw something on the internet that is just so typical. <laughs> Instead of high school, and two young white kids are pulling pranks on the students. So one guy is in the trash can, and the other one's interviewing somebody about uh, Halloween, and then the guy pops up out of the trash can behind him with his little costume on and scares them, and they're getting a good laugh. And they call this one young brother over, and they talk to the black guy, and the guy jumps up out the trash can, and without, I mean, it was just reaction. The brother just turned up, pop, and like hit the dude, and the dude just drops back down to the trash can. <laughs> and the lid closes. And and the brother's like, oh man, damn dog, I'm sorry. But it was just his programming was completely different. It was like how we react to fear and those kind of situations is going to be completely different. And that's why we always go to horror movies and laugh at the white people who, you know, when they hear the noise, start going, John, is that you? It's like, because that's the opposite of what we would do. I'm gonna get you sucker was initially only released in five cities and none of them were New York or LA. But there was a starving market. People came because they had not seen themselves and that's what the conditions at that time was. It's just a vacancy of anything out there for you in terms of entertainment. Journalists would ask me about negative stereotypes and do I think that I'm uh, confirming for white people what the ideas of black people I said, this is a comedy. Said, this is like airplane. I said, I grew up watching the Three Stooges and I never thought, wow, white people are crazy. When I was doing it in Living Color, it wasn't about doing a black show. I wanted to do a show that was really about everybody. Everybody that Hollywood didn't know what to do with, I knew what to do with. My comedy education wasn't just Richard Fryer and Red Fox and Miles Mabley and people like that, but it was also Monty Python and it was Cheech and Chong. I was in my third year of college at the uh, Tuskegee Institute and uh, was studying to be an engineer and, you know, I'm going to drop out to become a stand-up comedian. I had the conversation with my father. He said, son, you should finish school. He said, you should get the degree just so you have something to fall back on. And I said to him, I said, you know, I, I understand that, Pop. I said, but I see it like this. If I have a cushion that I know I can fall on, I'll allow myself to fall. I said, but if I know there's nothing but hard concrete, I'm going to do my best to stay standing. I think had I finished high school, got a job in the post office, bought a little white house with green shutters and a white picket fence, nice wife, two children, 
cut my grass every week, my father would have said, that's a very good life. My mother said there is something beyond that and reach for it or go for it. In elementary school, early on, she became president of the PTA. When I moved to a second elementary school, she became president of that PTA. And I asked her once, I said, well, why do you do this? And she said, number one, if I'm going there and if I'm going to be involved, I think it's going to be better for my boys. And if it's better for my boys, it's going to be better for all of the other children in that school. But when I went to piano lessons every Thursday, I had to walk through the Clark College campus, the Atlanta University campus, and the Morehouse College campus. And I was in awe of these buildings. And I can remember coming from the Ashby Street Theater one Saturday. And that was Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, the president of Morehouse College, walking across the campus, and I'm 20 yards behind him. And I find myself trying to walk like Benjamin Elijah Mays. My relationship with Thurgood begins at an NAACP mass meeting in Atlanta. And as we were leaving the church, I said to my father, hey, Daddy, I'm going to be a lawyer like Thurgood Marshall. And my dad uh, looked at me as if I had lost it. And we never discussed it again. I applied to seminary and I applied to law school. I spent the summer of 1957 trying to decide that whether I was going to spend my life at the altar or at the bar. In the process, I discovered sin, and I liked it. And I remember when Wiley Branton moved my admission to the U.S. Supreme Court. As I took down my hand, I looked up at Thurgood Marshall, and he winked his eye. It was sort of the laying on of hands. It was saying, go ahead, my man. When I left Urban League to go practice law, I was basically uh, underground until Clinton asked me to chair his transition. So I came back. I sort of liked the in and out process. There is a definition of black America, but no definition of white America. And we are just as mixed up in views and needs, aspirations, as any other group of people. It's never been monolithic. There's always been dissent. There's always been a difference of opinion, a difference of approach, and that's healthy. When we went across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, we did not say that we would all come out thinking alike and singing alike on the other side. All of my career, I just tried to think forward. No matter how dire the current situation was, got to get better. I might have pursued a different career if I had become a teacher or a social worker, which were the choices that women had when I was growing up. But I selected the field of nursing to train in. And it was in that codicil of training that I learned about human life and about the circumstances that people find themselves in. And I learned that everyone who was not a member of the Church of God was not a bad person. And I didn't need to fear them because they were sinful. And I couldn't make judgments about their personal choices. I really just needed to take care of them. I'm really proud that I had the opportunity to serve in a position at the national level, confronting some of the most difficult issues of our society. When choice is denied, the first women who will lose that choice are the women who are likely to fall into groups who are minorities or who do not have resources, and those are more likely to be my African-American sisters. I really didn't start out to be a communicator, although I must say that my mother's a minister, her father was a minister. We went to church on Wednesday night. We went to church on Sunday morning. We went to church on Sunday afternoon. We went to church on Sunday night. We went to church a lot. 
So I've listened to a lot of lectures in my lifetime on very hard church benches. People really can be persuaded to think differently about an issue. You know, my mother traveled all over the country, tent revivals, a female minister in a fundamentalist denomination is not a common sight. So I learned that you can stand up for what you believe in and that people will come to respect that even if they don't agree with you. I, I started this book to describe the life of my great-grandmother and it, it's almost been like a magnet that has sucked me in. And so I wanted to lay down the history of my great-grandmother who was born the year before emancipation, my grandmother, my mother who was a minister, um, my own life, and my daughter's life, and the tremendously rapid trajectory of slavery to Harvard's educated lawyer in a very short span in human history. I'm really sorry that my daughter didn't have an opportunity to grow up in a segregated African-American community, as I did in the early years of my life in St. Louis, where the lawyer lived next to the house painter, lived next to the doctor, lived next to the preacher, and we were all together. That can have an enormously powerful influence on the community and the value of keeping and raising our children properly. If I could help one woman in the African-American community not give birth to an unwanted child, I feel that I've made that contribution to the advancement of my race and the people who came to this country through a path that was not of their own making. Now this gets right down to the interaction between me and my mother because she really didn't much like the way that my career turned. She wanted me to be a missionary nurse and to bring enlightenment to the dark continent of Africa. Uh, but in fact, what I tried to do was to bring enlightenment to the dark continent of North America. By the first time I saw a rap was in Charles Gallery in Harlem, from the 371 and Tipsville Thieve and all these places where it really emerged. I was inspired by it from a cultural standpoint. I mean, it was, it was the whole lifestyle and attitude thing that, that came from it. Middle class were very upset with it. You know, anybody who had it one step out of the ghetto uh, didn't like it very much. Those clubs, they, they, you know, you, wear, you had to wear shoes. Those clubs didn't like rap. There was no uh, support in the music industry. The guy who signed Curtis Blow's Christmas rap was a British A&R director, signed it for London. First time he got played on the radio was in Amsterdam. It was something that the black executives at Polygram Records did not like. In fact, even when it started to develop, the first time a video got played, it was MTV, not BET. BET wouldn't play it. Anybody of color who had resources <laughs> didn't like rap. Uh, the authentic expression of, of, of what's going on in the minds of the poor people is shocking sometimes, the language they use. They want to act as if we don't talk about it, it doesn't exist. If the struggle of these people don't, doesn't come out in, through rap, it doesn't come out at all. If they don't say fuck the police, then we'll never have a dialogue between police and community. See the violence in our communities that we ignore. Suddenly, it's a big news story because a few rappers expose uh, a mindset that's in our community that's sad. And, and I believe that mindset has to come up, and bubble up, and let's discuss it come up with solutions. And having spent my whole life loving and appreciating the culture, I see what great contributions it makes. You know, to see the BC Boys go on tour with Run DMC early on, what that meant. Really made a difference in this generation. You know, I see the connectedness that's promoted in that. But the Israeli rapper and the Palestinian rapper and the African rapper and the French rapper, they all speak for, if not from, the position of being locked out. And here they are connected and appreciating each other the way they were never before. I remember when I was growing up, when my father was president of the NAACP in New Orleans at the same time that Medgar Evers was shot in front of his house in Mississippi. I remember that people would call and make death threats over the telephone. And my father would come home at night, uh, pull into the driveway, turn off the light, and blow the horn. So my mother could come out and just make sure that there was no one there. My 
father's career, in many respects, uh, for him to become mayor in 1977 was really the capstone of a career which began in the 50s uh, when he was a lawyer. The NAACP Legal Defense Fund, uh, alongside A.P. Turo and Thurgood Marshall and all of the others, Connie Motley, he became the first African-American elected to the state legislature in Louisiana since Reconstruction, first African-American judge. His career was symbolic of the change that was taking place in the South, taking place in Louisiana, and taking place in New Orleans. Katrina is an American tragedy. There were times when the, the aftermath was taking place, and I asked myself, is this a city I know and love? It's as though certain people after the hurricane cheered that a lot of African Americans were displaced. You know, the, the cocktail commentary was good. These folks are gone. We will rebuild the city without them. I don't understand it. One of my sisters completely lost her house. What the jury's still out on is, is the question of why there were four or five levee breaks uh, in the days uh, following Katrina. For New Orleans to move forward, it cannot be a house divided. It has to be a house unified. My dad always said you can't get ahead and do what, everything you want to do in life until you know your past, understand your past. When I first had a chance to go to Africa and actually, for once, be around people that were my color and that, oh, it was just, it was a great thing. It was like, wow, I just felt so good. So when, you know, a white person goes to Africa, they might get the feeling that I feel when I'm, you know, in Russia. <laughs> I love Muhammad Ali. I love what he stood for. He even went to jail for his belief, and I think that's the ultimate role model. I mean, you can't get better than that. Zena Garrison was the greatest. I remember when I was, like, eight, we went and we hit with her in Texas, and it was the best experience. When she got to the finals of Wimbledon, I remember it was... I really was happy because we got a chance to stop practicing for once and go home and watch it. And it's hard to be a parent and a coach. My dad taught himself tennis. He decided one day he wanted to learn, so he bought a magazine, he bought video, he bought books. He taught my mom, and then they taught us. And he wasn't a spring chicken when he taught himself. I mean, <laughs> he was, <laughs> I'm not going to say how old he was, but then people that age would probably be offended. <laughs> We stopped playing juniors because, I mean, my dad saw all these parents, so it's like the parents have so much pressure on their kids, and they're so overbearing, and they're yelling at their kids. You know, I mean, most of these kids never even made on the circuit. It wasn't that serious. So he wanted us to not be in a part of an environment like that and just live as, as normalized as we could, just training. You know, we didn't need to be in tournament play, and he also thought that we would get burned out, like, okay, if you play all these junior events, when you finally get to the professionals, it's like, you'll be tired of playing. It wouldn't be anything new. Venus definitely opened a lot of doors for me because she was first. You know, for me, it was like the Red Sea. You know, she's part of it, and I just kind of walked through. Like, I'll be like, okay, Venus, I'm playing so-and-so. Oh, hit to her backhand, and then hit a slice and come in, and all you have to do is put it away. And I'm like, gosh, how do you know all these players? I said once, I'm the most underestimated eight-time Grand Slam champion ever. <laughs> Every article that I do read, it's like, you know, she overpowered her opponent. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, wow, I didn't even, they don't even know how hard I can really hit, because I'm, I'm telling you, I'm not hitting the ball as hard as I can. It's a lot more than just hitting the ball as hard as you can. It's all about strategy and moving your opponent and just really figuring them out. Like, I never get credit for mental, and I just, just, you know, I think that's kind of, it, it's kind of frustrating, but at the end of the day, I'm very happy with me, and I'm very happy with my results. When you train for something for your whole life, you, you're pretty much ready for it. Very fortunate the neighborhood, Coney Island, after the, uh, the Depression. If our parents didn't get home in time for dinner, I had a choice. I had a choice. I could go and get some cafilta fish with Izzy, or I could go down the street and get some corned beef and cabbage. It was not until we left there and got into the reality of the rest of the world where the racial problem existed. A lot of us, of course, gravitated to Greenwich Village because that was the same society. I was a hippie, you know, I was a beatnik. Ran a hootenanny in the village from 1959 to 1962. The reason why I was down there in the first place 
was uh, the Blacks, Jean Genet's avant-garde theater called The Blacks on St. Mark's Place and 2nd Avenue. Of course, that later became uh, the Negro Ensemble Company. But in that original cast, I get loose pimples when I talk about it. In that original cast was Roscoe Lee Brown, James Earl Jones, Cicely Tyson, Maya Angelou. Out of that came the, the Roots people, obviously, and all the stuff that happened in theater and in early television, which was New York, from that one production. We were one amorphous, wonderful, creative bunch of people. So you see, uh, and at, uh, at Wilt's Rolf's Paradise, you'd see a big table, maybe Godfrey Cambridge and Raymond St. Jacques and Cosby and myself, not wanting for anything, but enjoying ourselves and telling jokes. A uh, brilliant actor by the name of James Edwards that played the character of Coney in a film called Home of the Brave. He came very close to getting an Academy Award. The scuttlebutt with James Edwards had an affair with uh, some Caucasian actress, and I won't mention her name. And something happened in public, and that was the end of James Edwards. When I created what is called, I'm going to give you what you want, I'm going to act like you want, and I'm going to speak like you want in order to get this job and to further my career, all the way to the Academy Award. Now, when my contemporaries have won the Academy Award, their careers went crazy. I didn't get a phone call for a year and a half for a job. Whenever there's a story where African Americans have made history, nine times out of ten, those characters have been played by Caucasian actors. A good friend of mine, the late George C. Scott, uh, got an Oscar uh, by playing Patton. And I had three uncles in the tank battalion that Patton commandeered. They beat the Panzer Division and cut a swatch to Berlin, and they rescued the Jews from Buchenwald, Auschwitz, and Dachau. Those were Patton's men. So I'm watching Patton, there's only one African-American actor, and he's playing Patton's valet. And you know who that African-American actor was? James Edwards. Every year, you and I can watch movies. We know completely about European history. And these young actors get these roles that I salivate for. When I won the Oscar, I said, wow, now I can do the Ashanti Empire. Wow. Maybe the one of the kings of Haiti. I wanted to play uh, Kwame Nkrumah, and I was turned down. And I had to settle for being second best to people who never did win a war. I was madly in love with Diana Sam. She played my wife in, in The Landlord. And Alan Ashby got to, to uh, do The Landlord as a, as a reward for winning the Oscar for his editing work for Heat of the Night. So me and Diana <laughs> had a love scene, and she was light-skinned, but she had the African lips. So we had to kiss, and we kissed, and then we would do all camera, I don't know, kiss and stuff. And Al said, cut, and he went to his first assistant, who was an African-American man named Kurt Baker, and said, how can I say this? Kurt said, just say it. So Al came up to me and said, and I said, let me explain the new lens. <laughs> I said, what do you mean? Well, you see, your eye on a, this new lens is going to be at least five feet wide, and your lips and your kiss going to be about this big. So when you guys are kissing, you're going to be all lips. I mean, we took 15 feet of lips up there. We were, you know. So we had to learn how to kiss like this. <laughs> My strongest memory is uh, listening to Richard Pryor albums in our house as a child, like during the day in the summertime, and then of course, which everyone does if you had that, you imitated <laughs> Richard Pryor. It was this amazing use of language and description, drawing a picture of American life as well that he depicted in his uh, performances. That was really, really informative about language and really informative about storytelling. Within America, there is this thing of just trying to define ethnicity um, very narrowly and forgetting kind of the history. I grew up in a way that, you know, there were Cubans, there are black Cubans, there are Jamaicans, there are African Americans, like all in one family. There are huge differences in terms of identity. 
in terms of how uh, people look at themselves. The Cubans, circa 1970, like, no, I ain't black, no, mm, I'm Cuban, no. My father, who was Cuban and his name was Elian, in during the civil rights era, adopted this whole alternate identity of calling himself Danny and kind of complete erasure of his accent because he realized um, it was really complex in terms of the way black people spoke about race, in the terms of the way white people talked about race, in terms of the people from different ethnic groups, their assumptions or prejudices about different groups, and he felt that taking away his accent is kind of being more a fly on the wall. Having grown up and seen all of that, for myself and, and part of the work is kind of broadening what we think of as identity, that they are all constructions. Part of what I have done thus far in terms of the photographic work and the filmic work is that there are open-ended kind of narratives. For instance, nothing really happens in corridors. There's two women in these architectural domestic settings and they just go from their day to day. It's to kind of suggest a particular time period and, and having the viewer try to interrogate, well, what is going on in this woman's head at the moment of emancipation? Or what is going on in this woman's head at the midpoint of the civil rights era? And so maybe that might get a viewer to think about what they're thinking about now, given the, uh, the political period that we are in at present. Everything in the Negro League was just like Major League. We had the American League, we had the National League. I was signed by the Philadelphia Stars. They used to call us the, the choir boys and the saints because none of them were drinkers. We played for the love of the game. Now, it wasn't anything for us to play on the weekend. Like nine games. We played in towns, especially like in Alabama, Mississippi, and so forth and so on, where they got curfews on black people. Some of the towns, we didn't even see black men. And to me, it was heartbreaking, you know, because I never was used to anything like that. Well, you know, they called us all kinds of names, and, and that's when they had all that segregation down there. They had the group of the Klan. But they came out and a lot of white people, when they wanted to admit it, they said, well, I've never seen a ball game like that. You know. After our season was over and the major leagues was over, they used to come up with some ball players that would play against us. A lot of the major league ball players wouldn't play against us. In 1940, I was voted the rookie of the year from the league. And I was one of the ball players that was picked to play in this all-star game. So I was a little shaky, you know, all these Joe DiMaggio's and all that kind of stuff. The first time I came to bat, I hit a, a double the right center field. I'll never forget it. The next time I came up, I hit one to the left field. I was sliding in the second base. Because in those days, I was pretty fast. I said, it's just a matter of the color of the skin. Jackie was only in our league for one year. That was 1945. We had the jacking went up. Well, our tennis started falling off. I came down with rheumatic fever. I was supposed to go to the giant training camp, whatever they were going to send me. And I never made it. I look at some of the ball players and the way they're playing now, it's altogether a different game. We never had coaches, we never had anything like that. Our teams had one man that ran the team, that was the manager. And no one was trying to help the teacher anything because of the fact they were worried about their job. You know, so I had often thought about if I had gone in and went through a farm system, you know, where they had people tell me what I was doing wrong and so forth and so on. It could have been different, but who knows? <laughs> I grew up in a house full of books. Both of my parents were educators. So we actually had a second basement that probably had somewhere between eight to 10,000 books in it. My mother had me take speed reading when I was in the third grade. And by the sixth grade, I was reading a book a day. One of my favorite books. Was, my daddy was a number runner. <laughs> I, to me, that was just like when I first read that book. It's funny, I went back and read it recently, and it was just so tame to me now. But when I first read it, the scene in the movie theater just like blew my mind. 
it's not like, oh, I read, I read a dirty book. <laughs> I've always had a very vivid imagination. Funny, because when I was younger, all of my teachers always told me I was going to be a writer when I grew up. I never believed it. I didn't start doing it until, you know, I was in my 30s. <laughs> I never actually wanted to be a book author. It was very strange how it all started. I wrote one short story in November 1997, actually. It's almost been 10 years. And I sent it out to four or five friends. And I never expected anybody else to ever see it. I was just like, you know, I wrote the story last night. <laughs> what do you think about it? I mean, the next thing you know, I'm getting emails from people I don't know saying, oh, I, you know, someone sent me this story. You know, have you written anything else? It's the hottest thing I've ever read. So I ended up putting first night, the airport and the seduction on my AOL web page. And within three weeks, my AOL site got uh, 8,000 hits by word of mouth alone before it was taken down because of the content. I ended up in the Sex Chronicles out in May of 2000. That immediately sold over 100,000 copies, and the rest just kind of goes from there. <laughs> Some people were becoming obsessed about trying to figure out who I was, and then um, people were masquerading as me. I actually have met someone masquerading as me before in Jamaica, of all places. <laughs> I sat there and let her talk, and, you know, eventually I told her that I really was a... <laughs> And she was really embarrassed. It turned out she was a bookstore manager from Florida. I was at a book signing once, and a lady actually came up to me and fell into my arms crying and told me that she realized that if she didn't get help for what happened to her as a child, that she was going to turn into the main character of my book. And, you know, if I had written a manual on sexual addiction, nobody would have really read it. But by doing it as a fiction-based story where people get caught up into the character and that kind of stuff, it can also have almost the same impact as the actual manual would. I feel that if women are going to have sex during their lifetime, and the majority of women are, that there's no reason that they should walk away from the experience any less satisfied than the man. I hope that by reading my books that women will realize that they do have their entitled to make demands or ask for certain things sexually, because men do not hesitate. We're the women that we are, that we go about every day, and there's a woman that we wish we could be. Thirty-seven songs. Fret not thyself because of evil doers, neither be thy envious because of workers of iniquity. And around the 25th verse, it says, uh, I'm, I've been young, now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken. The uh, strange thing, I've never said this publicly, is James Brown used to read that all the time. And uh, when he died, I was with his children when they opened up his house to claim his personal affection. He prepared to give his clothes for the funeral. And next to his bed was the Bible open to the 37th Psalm. You know, there were maybe two or three blacks before him that went mainstream, that King Cole, people like that. But James Brown was the first one that made mainstream go black. It's hard to grow up with that reference point to manhood and not internalize. So I learned a lot of politics being around, you know, Shirley Chisholm and Jesse Jackson and others. But I learned manhood from James Brown. And I guess even subconsciously, when I would come back to New York and begin activism and we were still close, I kind of brought that into my activism, a kind of believing in the picture you painted in your own mind. I got that from James Brown. And in fact, he loved controversy. He would say, that's good. You want everybody talking about it because that's the point to move forward. I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and the whole Pentecostal movement was very theatrical, very passionate, very dramatic. And in many ways, uh, the civil rights movement and empowerment movement is theatrical. Martin Luther King used to act in Birmingham, Selma, the drama of Martin, the drama of kids going to jail. So part of that, of course, is deep, hard struggle, but the theatrics of it in a media age brings the point home. Absent that, you're sitting in some uh, uh, university trying to explain what drama drives home. Many of the black entertainers started their art in the black church. It was one of the few places we could assemble it was one of the few places that white did not dictate the program. You got to remember, most blacks that were a boy and a girl and a maid or whatever during the week, you were chairman of the deacon board on Sunday. And it's the first place you had a title. You had a, a, a level of respect in society. 
So the church was not only our spiritual home, it was our social and our political and our economic headquarters. Everything started. Black colleges started. Black businesses started. It was our life. I had a, a black conservative tell me on a talk show once, you got to remember, I didn't make it because of civil rights. Civil rights didn't write my resume. I said, yeah, but civil rights made somebody read your resume. I wanted to run for president because I wanted to put us in the debate. No matter how eloquent somebody says we're beyond race, we're not. Just look at the facts. We are still doubly unemployed to whites in America. Today, we still are incarcerated at a higher rate for the same uh, criminal accusation, same criminal background. We still are three times more likely to be turned down for a bank loan with the same credit, same income. I knew it was unlikely I'd be president. Even if everybody running against me died, they would have found a way to go and, and make somebody else president. But I knew that they couldn't, once I got on that stage, control the debate. If you judge a tree stress by how deep the roots run underground. And the black church was the roots for us. And I think that that's what you're seeing in the hip-hop generation, this disconnect, this dislocation. We told them, you're free now. It's beyond race. You don't need all of that. And we gave them nothing to replace it. And then we look up at 10 years and say, what's wrong with these kids? What's wrong with them is there's nothing grounding them. So there's nothing to violate. There's not, no legacy to continue. You're connected to nothing. So manhood becomes thuggism or hoodlumism or not did you go to college, but did you do your time in jail? You're a real man because you got shot. Well, who decided after two centuries of struggling for educational excellence that being a thug now is the definition of black manhood? But this imposed culture that you act the fool, that it's a new way of step and fetch, and they become the gangsterized thug Uncle Tom that entertains white worst opinion of black folks. Anytime you study our history, we use our art to reach up, whether it was Roberson or Marion Anderson. It wasn't just to reflect what you see, it was to look at what wasn't there and put everybody's mind toward trying to beat that. In slavery, we sing, go down most, swing low, sweet chariot. We wasn't thinking about niggas in the field picking cotton. Our art never just reflected what was there, it also was a vision of what wasn't there, and it helped move a people toward that. And that's what I think we've lost, and that's what we've got to get back. I grew up in Inwood, the, the northern end of Manhattan, and it was a Revolutionary War battlefield. And there's also a house on Broadway, at about 204th Street, that was an old Dutch farmhouse from the time that uh, New York was New Amsterdam, a, a Dutch colony. Uh, we used to find uh, musket balls and arrowheads and, and really old bottles uh, in vacant lots and places in that neighborhood that uh, had been there since colonial times. So I, I was always fascinated with, with what had gone before me, and uh, it's something that uh, has been part of me ever since. It was very difficult for my father. Um, he, if he had had his dream, he would have played in Count Basie's band. I mean, that's that would have made him the happiest person in the world. He would have done that until the day he died. And he never got that opportunity. So he became a police officer and did very well as a police officer. And he retired, he was a lieutenant. Uh, but you know, music really was his, his heart, his love. I was uh, attending UCLA and uh, they had a jazz festival down in Orange County. So I went down to check them out. and. They introduced me to Miles, and they say, Kareem, this is Miles. Miles is Kareem, and he looks at me and says, it must cost you about $500 to get a necktie. And then he just kept going, you know. And uh, I was like, wow. That's not, not the type of thing that you expect that's going to happen when you meet your hero. You know, you expect a more meaningful moment. Within the next two years, uh, playing for UCLA and doing as well as, as we did, um, I came to Miles' attention as, the, the center for the UCLA basketball team. And then I, I ran into him on 135th Street. He's been working out at, at the Y there. And he knew who I was at that point. It was like we were old friends. You know, he invited me to his home. We went to his home and watched uh, some fight films. Just uh, hung out for the rest of the day. Miles was a serious athlete and did the whole thing 
I would go into the gym with Will, and Miles would usually be there. He did a serious boxing workout, it was a couple hours, and uh, you could tell, you looked at him, he was in great condition. First game in the NBA uh, uh, was against uh, the Pistons at uh, Milwaukee, and they had Walt Bellamy. Walt was like near midcourt, and I passed him about three times at, at one point, going from offense to defense, and he never got out of the midcourt area to either end of the court. And he said, you know, slow down, you're going to make me look bad. That was something that really made me appreciate playing for, for John Wooden, the fact that uh, I didn't have to be a bruiser. Uh, I wasn't going to beat Will. I, I didn't have that type of bulk and you know, physical presence, but I did have uh, speed and agility, and I, I could make an impact on the game using my, my talent. You had myself, you had Dr. J. Uh, he, he, he filled a few people with, with his stuff, okay? He had George Gervin and Errol Monroe. I mean, certain guys, just if you see them play, I mean, it, it, it strikes you and you, you want to see more. Win or lose, but just watching them execute their talents was, was really something to, to enjoy. I started writing when I was in grade school, and uh, at one point I wanted to be a journalism major. I wrote a history book in 96 called uh, Black Profiles and Courage. The whole idea was to, to get people to see that President Kennedy's book was not complete. The quote I, I have in the book that, that I usually go back to is, uh, I'd rather be a lamppost in Harlem than, than governor of Georgia. People don't understand a, a black American saying that, but it, it's, it's so true. Um, being someplace that you are accepted and um, encouraged to be at your best. I, I remember a, a friend of mine had been away from home for, for two years playing basketball. He said when he got back to New York, he took the train right up to 125th Street and just walked the length of 125th Street and started crying because he was so happy to be back in that cradle. It's like it's like home. It's, it's like uh, some some place that that we keep with us uh, all the time. I became a curator at a moment where there hadn't been many black curators in mainstream institutions in this country. I grew up in the city going to museums. It's really how I decided I wanted to spend my life in a museum. And the only way to be able to do that was to work in one, really. One of the funniest experiences I had when I began working in the art world is that people always assumed I worked for Thelma Golden, not that I was Thelma Golden. The first artist that excited me would have been Jean-Michel Basquiat. I was a high school student in New York City at the time that the East Village and Soho scene began. At that time, Jean-Michel was working, and his work was very present. I can't say at that point I understood his work, but I'd say through my discovery of his work, it really opened for me the sense of what the art world was. We've had a long tradition of black artists whose work has gone at the heart of speaking about the injustice of this society. But we also have a tradition of artists who have made work for the pure pleasure and joy and beauty that art can bring. And I don't think either of those things makes them more important or less important or more authentic or less authentic as artists in our culture. Can they separate their own life from politics? Perhaps not. But can they separate their work? Certainly. But Whitney was an interesting situation for me because on one hand, as someone who's just interested in art, all kinds of art, art from all eras, it was amazing to work at this New York institution that really defined American art. But also, I could not be at the Whitney and not acknowledge the legacy of exclusion. You know, one of the most interesting art experiences I had as a child is I grew up around this series of sculptures of black heroes that were created and commissioned by some alcohol company. And if you know, if you bought this alcohol, you could buy it from the back of the box. And they were created by an artist named Inga Hardison, a black woman sculptor. And I realized on one level how this was sort of one of these, you know, gift with purchase sort of situations, the art that you got. But that was a really amazing gesture, to have this amazing woman artist making these sculptures, one of W.E.B. Du Bois, Charles Drew. So I think even the definition of how 
art can be in one's home uh, should be why, because I think that I was influenced by things that weren't necessarily shown in museums. If there are spaces that we have not entered, and an artist enters them, often there's a question about why they're there. I don't see it that way at all. I sort of see the possibility as that all the spaces we haven't entered, we should be entering. And there really isn't a sellout in aspiring or wanting that at all. It was two completely different worlds, um, working at MCA Records and also going to Howard University. You know, there were a lot of people that were, say, were saying that I was crazy. You know, I would walk around with my briefcase and say that I was going to be the next Barry Gordy and I was going to be a music manager and I'm going to be a mogul one day. You know, if you was coming up in, uh, you know, the late 80s during the time of crack, um, you was either going to be on crack or be in jail or, you know, die. You know, I, I, I think you had to be a little crazy to really make it out of that time. I first met Biggie in early 1993. I, I was looking for someone to kind of rival LL Cool J, like a sex symbol type. And, um, <laughs> and so I had called around and I had asked if anybody knew of any new talent. And they told me about this, this guy named Biggie Smalls from Brooklyn. And I was like really looking for a cliche, um, curly hair, light skinned cat, you know. <laughs> Yeah, you know, Biggie was blacker than ever. To be honest, I, I haven't signed any light-skinned guys. <laughs> the thing that really shocked people was when Biggie admitted that, you know, being young and black and living in America makes you feel like you want to kill yourself. Hip-hop was a, you know, a forgotten generation. The music programs were cut. We didn't know how to make any music. So we, 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 we started putting on records and it's looping the instrumental beat. We just created our own world. I think it was a way also to not really, really, really get mad, you know? We always use like the finest um, brand to, 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 to associate ourselves with. That's why we talked about Bentleys and Yachts and Cristal. But we were having an effect on these brands' bottom line, whether it was Cavassier or Cristal or Timberland or Nike. But, you know, we weren't getting paid for it. A lot of these huge companies just started slapping us in the face, whether it was Chris Dow saying they didn't want black people drinking their stuff. Or, uh, you know, Timberland saying that they don't make boots for black people. And um, so we just started making our own boots. I was walking down Times Square, and they had just put up a, a new billboard of myself. <laughs> this, is, this is the home of the Marlboro Man. You know, you got that redneck white Marlboro Man. It, it, you know, it, now you got this young black guy, and he got he has the biggest billboard in Times Square, and it's like 50 stories high, and they know the whole world's gonna have to come to New York and, and see this this message of black power, you know, with my fist in the air. And I didn't realize it was gonna be that big, so when it when they had put it up, I just, just stood up and looked up at myself for like three hours. It wasn't an ego thing. It was like. It was like now maybe people are finally get, you know, you know what I'm about. I'd rather show kids that than to show constantly see the cutaways of television of us just living in the project. You know, my whole life, you know, I, I just wanted to be somebody. Cecil Rhodes, he wasn't ready for black folks or for women. So when he wrote his will, uh, there weren't supposed to be any of us in there. And Alain Locke, 1907, he snuck in. Nobody was supposed to know he was black. We just celebrated his centennial of getting a Rhodes Scholarship. I wrote my dissertation on Zimbabwe. And I used uh, Rhodes' money to go back to Zimbabwe and, uh, and do my research on how Zimbabwe became independent and the role that the Commonwealth played in the transition of Rhodesia to Zimbabwe. So it gave me a great deal of pleasure to be able to go around tip liberally with his money all over Zimbabwe. When I started for the State Department, I was 32 years old. I was African American. I was a non-career officer. I was a woman. And I was the mother of a three-month-old infant whom I was breastfeeding. Uh, and I don't think
think they'd seen that for a while. Among the career Foreign Service officers, um, there was a long-serving and distinguished cadre of senior African Americans who, for the most part, had, had made their career in positions on the African continent. But among those of us who were political appointees, uh, who came in at the, at the privilege of the president, uh, we were very, very few and far between. In the 1960s, uh, when we had Robert Kennedy and uh, Martin Luther King building political platforms around the issue of poverty, it gained a, a salience uh, that it hasn't uh, achieved since. Politicians have become fearful um, of the qu kinds of solutions that are necessary to deal effectively with poverty. They mean that government has to play a role, uh, whether it's through education, through health care, through uh, equal employment, through equal pay. Just as politicians don't like to call themselves liberal anymore, I think they're scared of poverty. Uh, and that's a, that's a tragedy because 37 million Americans live uh, in poverty in the richest country in the, in the world. And globally, um, half the world's population lives on less than $2 a day. So think about that. You know, that you can buy, you know, seven pairs of sneakers in this country for what they live on in a year. And somehow we're not supposed to care. It burns me when people say that some politician isn't black enough or, you know, is black as some white guy. What are we talking about? We have to have enough respect for ourselves as a people that we don't put ourselves in these artificial boxes. What defines us as African Americans is what we do with the gifts we have and whether we work to try to share them within and among our community and in the larger nation. And I just get pissed off at that old school mentality where we're talking about, well, somebody's got a white mother or a white father and they ain't black enough or they went to Harvard so they can't be, you know, they can't be really down. When are we gonna get past that? It's old think, I think, to assume that what's good for African Americans is the opposite of what's good for white folks. You know, why, why do we have to have that zero-sum mentality at this point? Why can't we all get better health care and better education? I'm an optimist, and so when I get angry, uh, it's, it, uh, it's easy for me to channel it into just doing more and doing it harder and trying to do it better. When I worked at Red Lobster, when I worked at, you know, Odd Lot or Alexander's or you know, the daily news. I wasn't working my way through stand-up. It wasn't like, that was my life. It wasn't like a kid working his way through school and they know, okay, when I get out of school, it'll be good. That was my life. If I work at UPS, I'll be really lucky. The day it clicked to me, I went to see a comedian at a Radio City Music Hall. A big, famous comedian at the time. As we're leaving, my brother goes, you're that good. <laughs> You're as good as that guy. <laughs> and it didn't dawn on me <laughs> that I could be... I was so happy to be out of bed sty You know what I mean? I was so happy to not be a busboy anymore. I didn't think, you know, I could play Madison Square Garden or any of that stuff. I'm fortunate to come up in the time I've come up in. I've been able to reap the rewards of not only my work, but... Mr. Pryor's work, Bill Cosby's work, <laughs> Eddie Murphy's work. I have a picture in one of my offices of Cosby, like a young Cosby with like a fedora and a cigar, like, like as cool as they come. And if you actually read the Richard Pryor book, uh, Pryor Convictions, every time Cosby shows up in the book, <laughs> he's actually the coolest guy in the Richard Pryor book. My daughter, Lola, goes to sleep with a little Bill doll. <laughs> That's so cool, man. Like, how much I love Cosby. I'm just like, <laughs> like, actually both my daughters sleep with Lil' Bill. Eddie Murphy revolutionized acting. <laughs> no one says that, but he really did. I just remember the way black guys used to act before 48 Hours. And there was a sidekick way of acting that Murphy didn't incorporate. 
and Beverly Hills Cop. It, I don't know, it was just so effortless. And it's, it's almost not acting, you know what I mean? Before that, black men would, you know, very earnest and, you know, I'm representing my race. And Murph kind of just made it, hey, I'm actual, this is my badge, let's go on. The thing that black culture is missing, it's not the comedian thing. Somebody will be that guy. The real question is, when is one, when are one of these black girls going to get their stry sand on? It's like, yo, I'm really about to set it off. I'm writing a movie. I'm directing a movie. I'm starring a movie. I can't wait to meet her. I can't wait, wait to work with her. You know, I can't wait to I meet the female, you know, Tyler Perry. That, that's going to be the next level. In my neighborhood, there's like three, four black people in my neighborhood in Alpine. And, okay, it's me, Gary Sheffield, Mary J. Blige, Patrick Ewing. Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, greatest R&B singer of our time, decent comedian. Who lives next to me? What's the white man next to me? He's a dentist. He didn't invent anything. He's just a dentist. That's what America is. My dad used to say this. You can't beat white people at anything. Never. But you can knock them out. Like, if you have six and the white guy has five, he wins. If you're black, you can't let it go to the judge's decision. Because you're going to lose, no matter how bad you beat this man up. You're always black. There's always going to kind of be an overreaction one way or the other. <laughs> Regarding your presence, be it good or bad. You know, Barack Obama, who's a great candidate, who, who I in, actually endorse, says like four words at a convention. He's the greatest man of all time. Just when you let Jackie Robinson in baseball, that doesn't mean it's equal. Baseball statistically isn't equal almost until the 70s. And, and you know, and why do I say the 70s? Because that's when you started to see bad black baseball players. The true True equality is the equality to suck like the white man. I mean, that's really Martin Luther King's dream coming true. Is guys suck it. I watch the Oscars. Okay, these are the people that made the good movies. What about the people that made the bad movies? That's most of the industry. I want to be like that. Not that I want to be bad, but I want to be licensed to be bad and come back and learn. I'm encouraging people to rethink what a black play is. That a black play is perhaps a work of theater that invites everyone to the table. I can write Top Dog Underdog. We were on Broadway. A lot of the folks who came to see Top Dog Underdog were African American kids, young folks. Most of them had never really been to a play before. So that was their first experience in the theater. They didn't know like to show up when the, sh the curtain said 8 o'clock. They didn't know that meant 8 o'clock. They thought, yo, it's like a show, you know, I can come at like 9, right? Because they ain't going to be on till 9, right? And they were coming in with their cell phones on and sort of, it was fantastic. Often in the black community, the audience feels that they are an active participant and they have to, go on, sister, you tell them, you tell them, that kind of thing. As if it's happening, you know, in their living room. We have to mine those riches more and celebrate those riches more. I think a lot of times we... Uh, we, we, we forget who we are. My father was in the Army, two tours in Vietnam, and one tour in Korea, and very rarely talked about the war. I remember when we traveled, when he was reassigned from, say, California to uh, Kentucky, or from Kentucky to North Carolina, he would dress in his Army uniform, because if you dressed in your Army uniform, um, the, the, the folks on the road were less likely to kill you. That's how dangerous it was, driving in the, in the 60s. Women are less uh, fearful of being in the margins, because we are in the margins. And if you're an African-American woman, you're in the margins of the margins, of the margins, of the margins. It's like being off, 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 off Broadway, where you can do whatever you need to do to get the job done. It's kind of like that. 
sisters like Nikki Giovanni were women that I looked to, like I want to write with that kind of fire, that kind of brilliance, that kind of unflinching honesty, that kind of bravery, that kind of music. I want to get all that kind of stuff in my writing, like they do. I think all my work is just, it keeps asking the same question, who are we and what are we doing here? The majority of the population imagines that, like the first thought out of my mind when I get up in the morning is, whoa, I'm a black woman. How do I fit into the white world? I mean, give me a fucking break. I mean, I'm like, yo, like, my dog needs to go to the bathroom, or my husband is talking to me, or whatever. You know, basic human stuff. I'm less concerned about the actions of the man, and more concerned about our own behavior, which is ultimately the only thing we can really do something about. The man got his feet up on the table. He ain't sweating it, because we got brothers on the corners killing brothers, and sisters on the corners stabbing sisters. He has effectively outsource the hating <laughs> to the community. Very good. Brilliant. Well, you got black folks like, I got mine, don't worry about his. You have a lot of that in the community, which I think is sort of a fear, a really stems from a fear of our own brilliance and a fear of our own possibility. Um, when, I was, when I was a kid, I burnt my house down. Like, I mean, like to the ground. Uh, it was an accident. My father and my mother stayed here in New York. He had a job here, but myself and my three siblings, two sisters and a brother, were dispatched to live with my grandmother. And my grandmother used to sort of sit me in her lap so she could keep an eye on me, right? So I wouldn't burn her house down. And, uh, and read to me from the Bible. And probably the thing that I remember most, um, I think it's Galatians. Chapter 6 or 7, you know. Be not deceived. The Lord is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, so also shall he reap. That made an impression on me. That, that in life, you, you, you take out of this world what you put into it. Two things were a part of my upbringing that I, that I don't think most um, white Americans would relate to. One, I, I cannot tell you the number of times that... You know, I was told when I was a kid, you know, I'm going to have to work twice as hard to get half as far. And two, I remember almost as if it were yesterday, my grandmother, she'd say, now remember, you want to be a credit to your race. It's as if you had, you were carrying a responsibility, not just for yourself or even your family, but for a whole category, group of people. I was my senior year at, uh, at law school up in Albany, uh, New York, and I had an internship at the, uh, the New York State uh, Assembly. We were invited to an official state dinner, and uh, as my wife and I were going through the, uh, the uh, receiving line, the governor sort of fixed on me and turned to his wife, Happy Rockefeller, and said, this young man's going places someday. If you look around today, you find that there are, there are a number of uh, African Americans who succeeded to the level of the highest uh, positions in some of the biggest corporations and best-known corporations uh, in the country. But we all pretty much started out at the same time. We were all children of what I call the movement, the, you know, the civil rights movement from 54 to 64, you know, from Brown versus Board of Education to the culmination uh, of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And so once you, you, know, you went to school, you got the same degrees now as everybody else, and then you get on the train at the first and you have to ride through to the end. I left my law firm and went to the dime in uh, 1988. And the world by 1988 was a much different place than it was in 1948 when I was born, 1958 when I was in fifth grade, or 1968 when I was in college. Um, by 1988, the jailbreak was on. And so people would ask me the question, they'd say, well, when did it, when did it first occur to you that you could become the CEO of a, you know, a large money center bank. And um, that was, you know, well, well, I, I had to deal with that question a lot. And I would say to people, you know, it actually never occurred to me that I couldn't. People in America feel compelled to bring in the notion of ethnicity. When people look at you and evaluate you or write about you, you're going to be judged on either side of the line, if you succeed, you're going to say, ah, here's a black person who succeeded. And if you uh, fail, it's like, well, here's another black person that failed. And so 
So, you know, we'll, we'll know we've made real progress when you just get to be a person. I grew up in the, in the project in North Philadelphia. Um, Hank Gathers is a, a, a playground legend. I mean, we grew up in the same housing project, and um, I wasn't fortunate enough to play with Hank because um, he played on the, the big boy court. Um, but you have to understand, when you're growing up in the project, you know, we find things to do 2 o'clock in the morning. Just playing basketball, we would, you know, we would paint us a, a track, and we would run up and down any summer night. I was in one of those fields doing something. More than likely, it was basketball. And I would tell my mother that's where, I, that's where I'm going to be. So she would come out and kind of just peek out to see if I was really out there with the guys playing, and, and I was. Once my mom found out that I was on the courts at 2 a.m. in the morning, she just let me go. My father, on the other hand, was... Um, pretty skeptical of, of me just always playing with the guys and I never was playing with the girls and then actually just the times I did play with the girls I found myself getting into fights if I'm playing basketball with one of the girls boyfriends maybe she thinks more than basketball is going on but that was the furthest of my mind I, I wanted I wanted to play basketball I wanted to win I wanted to compete this is what feels good to me playing with the guys uh, feel good to me, and it felt very, very natural. I, I butt ahead with all my coaches, to be, to be quite honest, because I had an attitude growing up as well because of where I grew up. You know, I was a North Philadelphia kid going to Virginia, and um, I wasn't used to conforming to the ways in which they did things at Virginia at a higher education school. I was used to, if I wanted something, I'd go get it. If I wanted something, I'd ask for it. If I wanted something, I'd work to, to get it. I wasn't used to just asking politely and being turned down. <laughs> when I actually was at Virginia, there was there was this one incident. We get this call saying that you know this young lady was um, about to commit suicide, and the only person she wanted to talk to was me. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm, I'm just I'm shocked. You know, you think you you play the game, and you want people to be in, entertained by by what you do on the court. And you really don't think you have an influence on a life or death situation. I'm a woman. I have opportunities to coach. I have opportunities to play. I have an opportunity to go to the Olympics. I hope I have a, you know, a player who's able to do all of those things because, you know, they come to me and say, do you think I'll be able to do this, that? I, I'm going to say sure. As an African-American woman, athlete, daughter, uh, friend, I think I can make a difference in the world just because I, I excelled at, at playing a sport. It was in 1948 that Truman signed the desegregation order. They didn't take it to Congress to pass a law. No law integrating the Army would have passed the Congress in 1948. But it really was roughly 1953-54 coming out of the Korean War when the final desegregation took place and there were no longer any segregated units in the Army. I came into the Army five years after that, 1958. I was um, a 20-year-old ROTC cadet, and uh, I came in second in the, in the best uh, cadet competition. And um, I was proud, second was good, and I'd worked hard, but it was a sergeant who said to me, you know, if you weren't black, uh, you'd have made top honors, you would have been first. And these southern professors of military science and these leaders from all of these southern schools simply couldn't let that happen. I went back in the South, of course, after I graduated from college in 1958 to Fort Benning, Georgia, the deep south, the really, really deep south. Funny part of being a black soldier in Fort Benning, Georgia, with your wife in Birmingham, Alabama, in 1964, and you're driving a Volkswagen, one of them burned cars with a New York State license plate on it and an LBJ sticker uh, was a chancy thing to do. Once I got stopped speeding, no doubt, from Birmingham back to Fort Benning, Georgia, somewhere around Sylacauga, Alabama, 
and I pulled over the side of the road. The state trooper came along, and I could see him in my rearview mirror as he approached, and clomp, 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 knee-high boots, brown hat, and he looked down at me, this black man sitting behind the wheel of his Volkswagen, and he looked down, and he said, hmm, boy, you need to get out of here as fast as you can, <laughs> and I drove off. <laughs> One of the kindest things ever done to me. <laughs> Very often I've been given assignments that were good assignments, and people said, well, you know why Powell got that job? They needed a black guy. And um, my answer to that, when I hear these rumors coming back, you know, that's why you got the job, because you're black and they needed a black. I just smile and say, well, fine. For 200 years, I didn't get the job because they needed all whites. So I'm not going to argue about that. The only thing that's going to count now is not I got the job or I didn't get the job or how I got the job. The only thing that's going to count is my performance. One of my favorite stories is of a Civil War Confederate general who heard that the president of the Confederacy, Jefferson Davis, was going to start recruiting black men into the Confederate Army. And he wrote it. And he said, don't do this. You can't do this. Use Negroes for whatever purpose you want, chopping wood, digging trenches, hauling cargo. But you can't make them soldiers. Because if a black man can carry a rifle and defend the South just like a white man, then our whole theory of slavery is wrong, and we will fail. Curly Victoria's musical captured America at a time when blacks had to play this secondary role. Even when they were smarter than their white masters, they could not show it. It was always yowza. Yes, sir. even though they were laughing behind Matthew's back, because they knew more than he did. So Reverend Curley goes in and he saves the black church down south from racist old captains. And at the end of the play, when it's coming to a finale, Curley now has to move on. Reverend Curley has to go save someone else, somewhere else. And the people say, stay here, Curley, stay here. He said, no, I must go. He said, but before I go, I want to say this to you. Let the Declaration of Independence inspire you. Let the Constitution of the United States protect you. And do what you can for the white folks. And I've never forgotten that, because what he was saying is, there are a lot of white folks in America who still have not crossed over. And it is an obligation of those of us of color to help white people understand that and to bring them along. We have progressed in this country to where uh, blacks are in the most uh, important positions in the land. Two black secretaries of state, one following the other, two black national security advisors. Well, one of the leading candidates uh, for president of the United States now uh, is on stage with uh, the most famous celebrity in all of America, and they're both black. When I talk to my children and my grandchildren, they just see this as normal. They don't know where it all came from. And I've had some interviewers say to me, why do you linger on this? I mean, it's all over. It isn't all over. It's not all over. It can't be all over. As long as we have young African-American boys and girls who are not able to get the quality education they need, we're still being held back because people look down. So there are lots of African-Americans who have succeeded in life, and that's great. But we should not think that this second civil war is over until um, we have provided opportunities for all Americans, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, poor white Americans. We should not think that we can rest on the achievements of the past 30 or 40 years. My mother's prayers, my father's wish, his stories, his cool, those are things they gave me. So I'm not saying that I'm deprived in a way, but this identity that came with my upbringing, it was not about the black church. I've had to appropriate that. I sing my mother's spirituals because I say that is the heirloom she gave me. She could give me nothing else. I maybe have a longing for that community. When I go to do find myself in a church, and being the apostate that I am, I don't go there very often, I weep. 
when I hear people stand up and do those things that I only heard from my mother, I weep. The whole notion of identity politics, which seemed to have congealed in the mind of academics somewhere circa 1985 and reached its peak maybe by 1995, um, I was oftentimes used as a poster boy for that. For some reason, I was on the stage with the likes of Carmen de Lavalard, uh, uh, Telly Beatty, uh, George Faison, um, an interesting group of, of uh, theater workers. And I said at one point, I feel that I'm an artist first and then I'm black. The room exploded. And there are people, as I understand even to this day, who my name is anathema. You know, this person denied his blackness. I thought that that's what a modernist artist was supposed to do, break out of, of, of categories. And that was a product of the 60s. We are not our bodies, all that stuff. Well, I got a lesson that day. Being a black man in the culture, something about it you've got to get over. Remember that? Trying to get over. I was trying to explain that to a table full of my, um, of my white friends about this concept, and they... They get an uncomfortableness and blank. Well, what do you mean, you know? Well, am I telling you the truth? Or am I seducing you always so that you won't know or won't recognize how fearful I am? The great dark fear in my life has been there'll always be a chasm between me and most people, be they black or white, because of the particularities of how I was raised in the world. I was expected to speak one way at home, but then when you go out in the world, talk proper, speaking languages, putting forward signals that at once said, I'm safe, I'm not going to hurt you, I'm smart, I'm not stupid, uh, you, can, you can respect me, and that you're not going to hurt me. I felt all of these my whole life, and I think a personality was developed out of that. That works in the art world. One who's kind of angry, has an axe to grind. Now, I have had a team that, where they touch the button and suddenly I let you know I'm black and you're not because that's in a way society is fatigued with it. Oh, black rage, I'm so bored with it. You know, why don't you get over it already? You know, look at you, you won a Tony Award. Look at you. You know, you were on Time Magazine. What are you complaining about? You know, one of my gods is James Baldwin. You know, here's a small, eloquent, uh, soft man with a razor-sharp mind speaking the King's English better than most. His references are broad, and yet there's no doubt he was a down brother. So, authenticity, identity, <sighs> love, faith. What is the idea of identity? Blackness should take a second level to the concern I have about human commonality, transcendence. In everything that I attempt, is there a level of honesty and rigor that is inflected with all that I am, what I've gotten from the Western uh, modernist tradition, what I've gotten from my mother, and father who were the conduits for black culture for me, what I've gotten from being a working class person, is it all there? Is it cooking? I was invited to do an evening honoring um, Nick Ashford and Valerie Simpson up in uh, Harlem. And everybody was, there was a big band on stage with a lot of people singing, doing their songs. And Daniel Bernard Romain, fantastic uh, young violinist, composer, and friend of mine, I said, Daniel, look, I want you to study uh, Ashton Simpson's uh, music and give me some licks. Well, we came for the rehearsal that afternoon, and the band was like, what? What is this? Nobody's going to do it. We're doing that. We have to fight. And I said, look, I was invited to do this. They were my friends. And I said, well, they let me do it. That night, man, I killed Daniel on his violin doing... You're all I need to get by. Bilty Jones is doing the isolation that he has learned from everywhere, from Trisha Brown to Merce Cunningham to James Brown to Fela Kuti. It was all there. And it was smart, it was generous, and I think it was lovely, considering how the audience responded. Am I black enough? Man, 
I was black and more than that.